I want to start off by reading our main passage of Scripture, just to get us in that mindset, kind of frame our discussion this morning. So if you will turn with me to the book of 1 John chapter 2, we'll be reading verses 15 through 17. Let's just go ahead and read through that, get that in the back of our minds and tuck that away to kind of frame our discussion this morning. 1 John 2, 15 to 17 says, Do not love this world or anything in it, If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires are passing away, but who does the will of the Father will live forever. Let's pray together. Uh, Dear Lord, as we enter this time this morning when we're going to be reading through your word, I, I pray that you have prepared this message Um, to help us know you better and help us better understand your will for our lives. I pray that you've prepared each heart here to hear what uh, you have to say to them through studying your word together. And I pray all of this in your name. I thank you for your son, Jesus. Amen. The last several times that I have preached here from this stage, I've been able to introduce myself as a part of the ministry staff. But as of last August, that is no longer the case. Now they've got some guy named Eli running the youth group. I don't know about him. But um, regardless, whether I'm part of the staff or not, it is a uh, privilege and it's an honor to be trusted to bring the message this morning. Um, Something that I get to do from time to time here and I always enjoy doing. It was uh, back in 2020 that uh, I got a call from Archie Ellett and he told me that the church leadership was asking me to team up with Eli Passan to lead the youth group here, to come on on a part-time basis to the ministry staff and lead the youth group. And uh, so we sat down with the elders, with the leadership, and they kind of told us their expectations. They said, we'd like you to do this for six months while we move towards hiring somebody to do it full-time. So we agreed to do that. And then about a year later, Um, We sat down for another meeting, and I mentioned, I was like, hey, we're well past that six-month mark. Um, What are you guys thinking moving forward? And then one of the elders, I think it may have been Trevor, one of the elders said, well, the way I see it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So uh, long story short, that six-month agreement turned into a total of 26 months. And uh, you you might say we got a little more than we bargained for, but, but it was a great experience. It was something I was glad to be doing. And then in August of last year, Eli followed the calling on his life and was officially joining the staff here at church on a full-time basis as our youth pastor. And that was a bit of a bittersweet thing for me because on one hand, I really did enjoy my time leading the youth group and it was an honor to be trusted with the responsibility of leading, leading our students. But on the other hand, I know that for this group to be effective, and to serve our students to the best of its ability, to its fullest potential, there needed to be someone in there leading that group as a full-time commitment. And that person is Eli Passon. Um, So on July 31st of last year, that was my last official Sunday night leading Highway 111, and I kind of, I got the opportunity to kind of reflect on my time there, to say goodbye to the kids, And it was a special night, and the the reason I bring that up is because there were two verses I shared with the students that night that I felt like really summed up my thoughts on uh, what I tried to accomplish working in the youth group. And I, I want to share those two verses with you as I start off the sermon this morning. The first one comes from Psalm 127, 1, which says, Unless the Lord builds the house the workers labor in vain. In ministry, you can put a lot of hard work into your plans and your ideas. You can put your best effort into it. You can give it your fullest attention. But unless it's God's will behind those plans and ideas, then all of your hard work is in vain. It's accomplishing nothing. So going into our time working together out there. Um, 
Eli and I were essentially at a point where we kind of had to build the thing up from scratch. Um, it was early in 2020, so um, the youth group had been set, shut down for several months due to COVID, just like everything else. And um, we were both brand new to that role. And the first two or three weeks we were running the youth group, our average attendance was roughly five kids. So not really what you want to see from a church this size. But from, from talking to the leadership and kind of going through our individual expectations, it was pretty clear that the Highway 111 needed a fresh start. And so we were very deliberate about what we were trying to build in that youth group. A lot of prayer and a lot of intention went into trying to make the services a lot more scripture-based. We spent a lot of time on teaching fundamentals, Bible basics. And the reason we thought that was so important was because if you want to be able to tackle the big issues, you have to have a solid foundation to build off of. If you want to be able to answer the, the big questions that are going on in those students' lives, you've got to start from a firm foundation. So at the start of this, this past year, 2022, I was able to do a uh, preaching series out there kind of tackling some of those bigger, more controversial topics, the things that the students were specifically asking to talk about. And the reason that I was able to talk about those controversial topics was because we had taken the time and laid the foundation of biblical truth. So I want to ask this question, what is your standard of truth? Because those big issues, those big controversial topics, that's not just something that is specific to the students. That's something that we've all got to face at some time or another in our lives. What is your standard for truth? Because if you want to be able to answer the big questions, the pressing topics, the controversial things, you have to know what your foundation is. What are you basing truth off of? And that brings me around to the second verse that I shared with them that Sunday night, which is 1 Timothy 3.15, which says, The church of the living God is the pillar and the foundation of truth. In chapter 3 of 1 Timothy, we see Paul laying out the standards and the qualifications for leaders in the church. Preachers, elders, church leaders, teachers, we're all held to a higher standard. And in verse 15, Paul says, the reason for that is because the church of the living God is the pillar and foundation of truth. We've got to be held to a higher standard because we are supposed to be holding up the truth. So what does this mean, the whole idea of the pillar and foundation of truth? Well, the foundation, you know, is the first and most important part of building any structure. If any of you have had foundation problems before, you know that that is a really serious threat to your home. If you're building something and you don't get the foundation right from the very beginning, it doesn't matter how much work you put into the rest of the house, eventually it's going to crumble and fall. And that's the same thing in our families, that's the same thing in our churches, if we don't lay that solid foundation, the thing we're trying to build on top of it isn't going to have any ground to stand on. And then he says that we're also the pillar of church. The pillar is something that supports the weight of something that is held up high for everyone to see. What Paul is describing here in this verse is a reference to the temple of Artemis. Um, this was something that existed in early Ephesus. The marble temple was said to have been 400 feet long, 150 feet wide, and had 127 massive pillars supporting a roof that was nearly 60 feet high and had hand-carved murals and ornately decorated gold. So it was an enormous structure supporting a huge amount of weight and displaying something of unimaginable value. That's the type of thing that anyone would be able to see for miles away. No one would be able to miss it. And Paul is saying that the church is supposed to be that when it comes to biblical truth. We're supposed to be the thing that, that truth can be built on on a solid foundation, and holding that truth up high 
for everyone to see. So point number one that I want to make this morning, and I'm going to sum up this sermon in four points. Point number one, to keep in mind as we move through the scripture, is that biblical truth matters, and it's something we've got to be willing to take a stand for. So with that point made, I want to take us back to the main passage for this morning that we read at the very beginning. Uh, 1 John chapter 2, starting in first fifth, uh, starting verse 15, says, Do not love this world or anything in it. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. So if you pause right there in verse 15, I think something about that wording can feel off to us. It can almost feel contradictory. I mean, we know verses like John 13, 35 that says, You'll prove to the world that you're my, you're my disciples by your love. And yet we have this wording in this passage over and over again, don't love the world, don't love the world, don't love the world. It kind of feels contradictory. It feels off. And yet we see similar passages like this all throughout the New Testament. In James 4.4, it has a very similar message, and it's even worded a little more harshly. It says, you adulterers, don't you know that friendship to the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. If you want to be a friend to the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. That's very strong language. That's a very harsh way to put it. Adulterers, you are unfaithful to your commitment. If you choose to be a friend of the world, you're an enemy to God. So what do these verses that we've read mean when they say, don't love the world, don't be a friend to the world. Because we know the word of God isn't going to contradict itself. We know that our calling is to show God's love to the people of the world. So these verses, they're not saying don't love people. They're not saying don't show kindness to everyone. So then if the world in these passages isn't referring to the people that are in it, What's meant by the world in passages of Scripture like this? Well, I'll throw several verses at you here to kind of give you some context on that. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, Satan, who is the god of this world, has clouded the minds of unbelievers. Revelation 12, 9 says, From the beginning, Satan has been deceiving this world. John 12, 31 says, Satan is the ruler of this world until he is cast out and judged in the last days. First John 4.4 4 says, the spirit that is in you is greater than the spirit of this world. See, the world is lost. On our own, we are lost. We are clouded. We are confused. The truth is hidden from us. The world as we know it is not the world as God created it to be. So in this context, when we are talking about the world, when we're talking about not being a friend to the world or loving the world, we're talking about the influence of the culture around us. The world's understanding of what is true and what is good and what is right and what is wrong is clouded in darkness and deceived by evil. It is mired in confusion. The world, the culture that we live in, is influenced by Satan and ruled by sin. So when we're told don't love the world, don't be a friend to the world, don't hold on to the world, we're saying don't let that culture ruled by sin rule you. Don't let the lost people tell you what is true, what is right, and what is good, because the culture and the people who are ruled by it are being influenced by Satan and lost in darkness. John 8.44 says, Children of the devil do as he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He always hated truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character, for he is the father of all lies. And that brings me around to point number two. Biblical truth 
should be what unites us to our fellow believers and divides us from the rest of the world. You've probably heard this phrase thrown around in church several times. Believers are supposed to be in the world, not of it. We are in the world, we are not of the world. This is not where our citizenship lies. We are supposed to be set apart from our old life, from our lost life. In John 15, 18 and 19, Jesus says, If the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. The world would love you as if you were one of its own if you belonged to it. But you are no longer a part of this world. Choosing to follow Christ means surrendering your old life, the life that was once ruled by the influence of the culture around you, that was ruled by sinfulness. And that means we're going to be set apart. And that means turning your back and rejecting that old life. We have this mindset that as Christians, somehow the highest calling on our lives is to just be vaguely nice and accepting of everyone. And as popular as that idea is, there's no biblical truth to it. There is no truth to the idea that uh, Christianity shouldn't be divisive. God's people are supposed to be set apart. And truth, biblical truth, should be the line that divides us from the rest of the world. In Matthew 10, 34, Jesus tells us, Don't suppose that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I came not to bring peace, but a sword. Choosing Christ, choosing to make him the Lord of your life, and choosing to turn your back on that old life, means that you are going to be set apart and divided from those who are still ruled by the world. Even though we are supposed to be divided, it, it's very important for us to know the difference between being divided and being divisive. The divisive person stirs up disagreements, causes hostility. They can't wait to find the next argument. That's not who we're supposed to be. Just because we're supposed to be divided from the world, we're supposed to be separate from the world, doesn't mean we should be divisive to the world. We don't seek out quarrels and confrontations, but at the same time, we need to know that there will be times in our lives where we're going to need to draw a line and take a stand. It can be surprising to us just how far apart we can be on issues, on, on controversial things between what the Word of God says and what the world says. It can be surprising how divided we really are. The thing is, biblical principles and biblical truth are always going to be countercultural because by its very nature, the culture is opposed to biblical truth. By its very existence, the culture, the one that is influenced by Satan, is going to be ruled by darkness, confusion, and lies. And because of that, when we speak the truth, that's going to be countercultural. And a lot of times that's going to be divisive. But what we've got to keep in mind is we really shouldn't be surprised when the world is acting like the world. Don't be surprised when lost people act like lost people. But where we need to be very concerned is when we have Christians who are acting like the world, when we have Christians who are acting like lost people, when people who claim to be followers of Christ are completely indistinguishable from the life they claim to have left behind. That is cause for concern. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul's giving a warning about people who call themselves believers but are still trying to cling on to that old life, the life that had them lost in death and darkness and sin. And in verse 6 of chapter 5, 
Paul says, don't be fooled by those who try to excuse their sin. Again, we're not talking about in the world. We're not talking about the people who are lost. We are talking about in the church. People who say they are believers. People who say that they have turned their back on their old life and surrendered it to follow Christ. Don't be fooled by those people who try to excuse their sin. Last summer, um, Archie did a series here on the book of Jude, a little bitty book in the New Testament. And the whole book of Jude is essentially written as a warning about people who claim the name Christian but are ultimately opposed to biblical truth by the way that they live. And in Jude 18 and 19, it says, There will be scoffers whose purpose in life is to satisfy their ungodly desires. These people are the ones who are creating division among you. They follow their own natural instincts because the Spirit of God is not in them. Again, people who claim they are believers, people who are in the church, people who have influence over God's people, and yet their whole purpose in life is to try and justify that sinful lifestyle that they were supposed to have left at the cross. Similarly, in 2 Timothy 4.3, it says, There is a time coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. Instead, they'll follow their own desires and look for teachers who will tell them what their itching ears want to hear. There's plenty of churches. There are plenty of preachers out there who are just going to preach something that makes you feel good about yourself to tell you what you want to hear. You don't have to look very far to find somebody who says that they are a Christian leader who wants nothing more to just affirm your lifestyle, but never hits you with hard truths. There's no shortage of churches like that out there. But I'm grateful we have a church here, leadership here, preacher here, who is willing to take a stand on those hard topics. That a lot of times is going to make us unpopular. This very sermon as I move through it this morning might make me pretty unpopular. But that's what truth is going to do sometimes. These verses that are warning against biblical truth and uh, warning against giving approval to unbiblical lifestyles bring me around to point number three. Truth does not change. We can try to twist it around. We can twist the biblical truth just like the people and Jude was talking about. We can try to find something to justify our sinful desires. But at the end of the day, biblical truth is absolute, eternal, and universal. There's no such thing as my truth, your truth, their truth. There's no such thing as something being true for a certain culture or a certain period of time that's not applicable to our culture today. But truth is absolute and unchanging. So let me put that into other words. There's no such thing as progressive Christianity. There is biblical Christianity, and everything else is false religion. In Hebrews 13.8, it says, The Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So do not be attracted by strange new ideas. See, our attitude towards truth, even within the church, has been so influenced by the shifting culture around us. The idea that Christianity should change with the culture, change with the times, and the idea that the authority of the Bible is somehow outdated and no longer applicable is an outright lie. And yet those ideas are being preached from the pulpits of churches. Any church or any preacher or any ideology that teaches about God's love, grace, and mercy, which is certainly a part of his character, but does that without ever mentioning sin or the consequences of sin, is doing nothing short of lying to you and selling you a false gospel. These ideas just pick and choose what parts of the Bible that you want to follow. 
and what parts of Jesus that you want to believe in. But the same Jesus who shows us love, grace, and mercy is the Jesus who calls out sin in our lives and asks us to leave that at the cross and follow him. See, a lot of people, this is one of my pet peeves. When a lot of people are looking at the, the law in the Bible, the, the moral standards in the Bible, they want to go to the, uh, the Gospels and say, ah, oh, but, but Jesus never said that. Jesus never said that. The Word of God is what Jesus said. You don't get to take the, the, the one quote from the Gospels that makes you feel good and just forget about the rest. And this is a quote directly from Jesus. Matthew 5.18, when he says, Don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writing of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. And we'll talk a little more about that purpose in a minute. And then he goes on to say, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose has fully been achieved. So if you ignore even the least commandment and teach others that they should do the same, you will be ignored in the kingdom of heaven. But anyone who obeys God's laws and teaches others that they should do the same will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now that is a stern warning, and that warning came directly from Jesus himself. People who call themselves believers but want to cut out sections of the Bible and pick and choose what applies to their lives today aren't people who are surrendering their lives to God's authority. If you just accept the parts of Scripture that you like and completely reject the parts that you don't like, the only God you are surrendering to in your life is yourself. You don't believe the Bible. You believe in yourself. If I say, well, this part of the Bible, I think that's true, but I'm just going to ignore that. I don't believe in the Word of God. I believe in me. There are so many topics in church that we tiptoe around because they're difficult to talk about. These type of things where what God's Word says flies completely in the face of what the culture says. The type of things where the world and God's people are moving in two opposite directions. We avoid, avoid certain issues... Uh, because we feel like they are too controversial, too political, too divisive to talk about in church. Why would we ever want to talk about these uncomfortable topic, topics like sexuality, marriage, family, abortion, transgender, you name it. All of these issues that are so controversial in the prevailing culture. Why would we ever want to talk about these in church unless we are wholeheartedly convinced that the Word of God is inerrant, relevant, true, and applicable to our lives today. What's important here shouldn't be your stances or your convictions on each little specific hot-button issue. But what is important is a matter of your conviction on the overall authority of Scripture. In the life of a believer who professes the lordship of Christ and believes the veracity of Scripture, then all of these things that are so controversial in the world around us should be complete non-issues to us because the word of God is the true and final authority. The evil one's strategy against God's people has been the same since the very beginning. He came into the garden and asked, did God really say that? Is that really what God meant when he said that? It worked for Satan then, and the very same ta tactics are working today. For the average believer, you're probably never going to be challenged to give up your faith entirely. The world's probably never going to tell you to turn your back on your faith entirely. But what you are going to be asked to do is to compromise and compromise and compromise again. I'm afraid that we try so hard to avoid being seen as political or divisive or stirring up controversy that we let the world around us dictate 
what the church is allowed to take a stand on and what we are expected to just keep our mouths shut about and go along with. When we choose to take a step back and avoid topics that we should be taking a stand on, what we're doing is surrendering something to the world that we should have already surrendered to God. The church is supposed to be the pillar and the foundation of truth. And we can't be weak and unreliable and wavering if we are going to be that foundation. This is important because lost people aren't going to find that truth anywhere else. The world's not going to give it to them. And if the church isn't giving the truth, where else are they going to find it? We're supposed to be holding up the truth, supporting the truth. And if God's people are going to be holding up the truth, sometimes that's going to mean taking an unpopular position on some very hard topics. And you might you might say, I don't want to come to church and hear sermons like that. I don't like sermons like that. Sermons like that make me feel judged. They make me feel called out. Well, good. That is what is supposed to happen. That's what the Word of God is supposed to do. In Galatians 3.19, we're told that the law was given alongside God's promise to show us our sin. You see, you don't just get the promise. You don't get ju- just get the promise of God's love, God's grace, and God's mercy, and the gift of salvation. The, vo- the Bible does not allow for any separation between the two. These good promises mean nothing without knowing God's holy moral standard for us. You can't separate the promise from the law. And then in Hebrews 4.12, we're told that the word of God is living and active. It is sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates dividing the soul and spirit, the joint and the marrow. It judges even our thoughts and our attitudes. The Word of God is supposed to call us out. It's supposed to show us the places where we're falling short of God's standard. And the reason for that is because what good is salvation? What good is the sacrifice of Jesus to somebody who thinks they have nothing to be saved from? To think someone who thinks they have no reason to change? What good is the gift of Jesus to someone who thinks they're already perfect just the way that they are. God's law exists to show us his character, to help us know him better, and it reveals the sin in our lives that needs to be dealt with, the things in our lives that were separating us from God's love in the first place. And that brings me about to my final point this morning. Truth should change us. Being confronted with the truth of God's Word is something that should drive us to change. The understanding that our sinfulness is what separated us from God's love should be something that motivates us to move away from that sin. There's another thing that is so prevalent in the church today is this idea that because you are saved, there's no reason to change. But that's not true. That is not what we find in Scripture. Our salvation should be the first step in our process of growing to be more and more like the example that was set for us by Jesus Christ. I'm going to use a pop culture example here, and I want to give a little disclaimer, because I have used this same example at another church before, in another sermon, and... um, it's, a, it's an example of something that was popular when I was in high school. So we'll see how well it lands here because last time I used it, I'll just say that that church crowd was a little more advanced in age and um, the, the point didn't quite land. But there is a Lady Gaga song. Now, are there, a lot, are there a lot of Lady Gaga fans in here? Yeah, I don't think there were in that church. But there is a, a Lady Gaga song from around 2010 and it became a massive hit. Um, it had this empowering message that says, 
you're perfect just the way you are. There's no reason for you to ever change, and no one can ever tell you otherwise. And the song essentially became the anthem for the LGTB pride movement. The name of that song is Born This Way. Has anybody heard that song? I feel like there's a higher chance of people hearing it in here. It was a big hit. It was a big hit. Um, So the title of the song, Born This Way, is really the only thing in that song that she got right, because in Psalm 51.5 it says, I was born a sinner, yes, from the very moment that my mother conceived me. You see, from from the moment that we are born, that human nature in us gives us desires that are moving us away from God. And the easy thing to do, the easy thing to do is just follow whatever temptation we are dealing with. That's the easy path. The temptation and weakness and struggle with sin is something that no one is immune to. It doesn't matter if you're lost or if you're a believer. It doesn't matter if you've been a believer for one day or one year or 50 years. It doesn't go away. We all struggle in our own ways, with our own issues. But the important thing to know is that even though we are born with these struggles and with these temptations, that's not who we were created to be. That is not God, who, what God created us to be. So this whole movement that says, That's just how God made me. I'm perfect just the way I am. This movement that lets our sin identify who we are, and these attitudes that we can never be told that we are wrong, we never have any reason to change, these are attitudes that are going to keep a lot of people from ever finding salvation. In Proverbs 14, 9, it says, Fools mock their guilt, but the wise acknowledge it and seek out reconciliation. The mark of someone who really understands their salvation is acknowledging the sin in your life and recognizing that there is a need to change. You're still going to deal with temptation. You're going to slip up from time to time. But the difference here The difference between someone who understands salvation and someone who is lost is that that sin no longer defines who you are. Your sinfulness can't be your identity. If you have surrendered to Christ, then you are no longer a slave to sin. You've been set free by saving grace. Having saving faith in Jesus Christ doesn't mean that sin and temptation just disappear, that they just go away. It doesn't mean that we are expected to suddenly be perfect, to never fall to those temptations. But what it means is that that sin, those temptations that we struggle with, no longer define who we are. We are no longer slaves to it. Even though sin remains in the life of a believer It no longer reigns in the life of the believer. In Romans 6, 6, we are told that for we know that our old self was crucified with him, so the body that was once ruled by sin will be done away with, so that we are no longer slaves to our sin. So here's the problem that so many people run into. So many people want the parts of Jesus that are going to make us feel good, that are going to build us up. People come to Jesus expecting, my life is pretty good. I'll add a little bit of Jesus in there and my life will get better. People come to Jesus thinking, okay, God, what can you do for me? But when you are confronted with truth, when you are confronted face-to-face with the sin that is separating you from God, the God who loves you so desperately and wants nothing more for your life than to be saved, then that's going to tear you down. A lot of times we need to be torn down so we can be built back up. 
But for someone who thinks that they're perfect just the way they are, they have no reason to be changing. They have no reason to feel guilt. They have no reason to be judged. That person is going to be very surprised when Judgment Day comes. And that'll bring me all the way back around to the main passage of Scripture for this sermon this morning. 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Do not love this world or anything in it. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, come not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires are passing away, but whoever does the will of the Father will live forever. So, believers, Christians, the question I want to leave you with this morning is what is it from your old life that you are, are you still holding on to? What is it that you should have let go of and left behind at the cross that are you still letting get between you and the life that God has called you to live? Our sin shouldn't define us. Our sin, our sin shouldn't identify who we are, but a lot of times it is so hard to let go of that. It is so hard to let go of that old life. We, we are supposed to surrender to Christ. And that means we are surrendering the hold that the world once had on us. And that's not an easy thing to do. It's not easy to be confronted with your own sinfulness, for your own need to change, to be confronted with the places where you've fallen short of God's standard. The difference of someone who is lost and understand, versus someone who understands salvation isn't that they no longer sin. It isn't that, that they've got it all figured out or that they've got all the answers. But the difference is that they can see the places in their life where they need to change and they rely on Jesus Christ to help them through that. John sixteen twenty five says, Anyone who tries to keep this life will lose it. But anyone who's willing to give up their life in this world will find eternal life. The world around us is lost, it is confused, and its understanding of truth and right and wrong are influenced by a culture that is ruled by sin. We need to choose to turn our backs on that, to turn towards Jesus and surrender the hold that the world once had on us. And that's not an easy thing to do. That's not something we can do on our own, and that's not something we are expected to do on our own. But surrendering to Jesus Christ means you're taking that first step, and you're trusting him to lead you the rest of the way. 1 Timothy 3.15, the church of the living God is the pillar and foundation of truth. It's time for us, the church, to be that foundation and hold up the truth because lost people aren't going to get it anywhere else. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I, I want to thank you for the word you've given to us. And I, I thank you that we are in a church that's not scared to take some hard stands when it's necessary. I pray that everyone here uh, understands that this isn't about us versus them. It's not about believers versus the world, but it's about us as believers understanding the calling you have made on our lives so that we can grow to be more like you and share that with the world that needs to know it. God, I pray that as we move into this new year, we can have a renewed understanding of the authority of your word and understand that your law is meant to help show us who you are. Help us understand your character and help us to grow to be more and more like you. And I pray that we will strive every day to trust you as we attempt to follow the example you've set for us. If, I pray that if there's anyone here who has a decision to make, that they won't put it off. I pray all of this in your name. Amen.
as we go into the time of invitation, you may have a decision to make. For believers, it may be a decision to renew that trust that you have in God's authority and in his truth. For others, it may be time to make that first-time decision. Maybe this is the first time you have been confronted with that truth. But I pray that you understand you don't have to clean yourself up before you come to Jesus. You just understand that you need Jesus and he'll lead you the rest of the way. So if you have a decision to make, something to pray about, this is the time to do it. The band's going to play. We're going to have a time of reflection and decision as we move forward in the service.